Hi, this is Krista Walsh. Hey, this is Daniel Arthur Smith. Hey, this is Terry R. Hill. Hey, it's Josh Hayes, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with my friend Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. There is a way for you to get a free book today. And we're also doing something a little special at the end of the episode. But before I tell you about it, I want to tell you about our two sponsors. The Galactic Satori Chronicles. A thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. Projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, these aliens are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Asher bands together with a group of friends, and these four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam Aliens, politics, and murder. Only the first one is new. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Vernon is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate, while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. The Galactic Story Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks and Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam can both be found on Amazon. Or just head on over to legendarium.com, check out the show notes for this episode, and in the show notes we will include a link where you can check out both of these books on Amazon and learn more about them and buy them if you would like to. And now for the free story that I was telling you about. This week our guest is Peter Cauldron, And his story, Trixie and Me, a sci-fi thriller with a twist, is available for free on Amazon. So head on over to Amazon and search for Trixie and Me, or head on over to legendarium.com, find the show notes, and we'll include a link there so you can get the story for free. And stay tuned after the outro, we have a bonus 20 minutes of interview footage from Peter Cauldron. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. This week, we are joined by Peter Cauldron. Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you for having me, Preston. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Um, We like to start each episode here with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie, where you tell me two truths about yourself and a lie, and I have to try to figure out which one is the lie. I'm on a losing streak, so I'm hoping to turn this one around. Um, <laughs> not counting on it, but do you have a two truths and a lie about yourself that I can try to guess? Sure. Okay. Um, so, number one, I guess, um, I was knifed in a street fight at the age of eight. I was actually mugged for lunch money. Wow. Uh, number two, um, I was in New York on 9-11, staying up at uh, Greenwich Village. But no, I didn't see either plane hit. There was plenty of smoke and sirens, though. Okay. And number three, I was a Christian preacher for a quarter of a century and passionately taught creationism. So see if you can pick which one of those is a lie. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like I said, not counting on this one. So, um, man, they all sound very plausible. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Wow. So, so kni- knifed in a street fight. Yeah. Uh, in nine <laughs> eleven, but didn't see anything. And uh, a Christian preacher. Yeah. Um normally I have some kind of like reasoning to it, and it's normally not very good reasoning. <laughs> so for some reason, 
Oh, man, I have it narrowed down to two. For some reason, I'm thinking the Christian preacher's true, so I'm going to say that's true. So I'm debating between knifed in a street fight or being in New York on 9-11. Um, I don't know if you've ever traveled to the United States because I know that you live I, over I, in Australia. I lived there for three and a half years. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kansas and Ohio. Um Okay. I so, love, love New York, went to Washington, D.C., um, L.A. Well, then, since you, okay, since you lived here for three years, then I did not know that. Okay, so I'm going to say that being knifed in a street fight for lunch money is the lie. Uh, that one's true. <laughs> oh, is it really? No way. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I was going to say, if you, if you wanted some reasoning, probably the best one is to think, um, you know, the most outlandish are probably the ones that are true. So there you right. go, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> knowing me of course so then which one's the lies is, is the christian preacher the lie no 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 being in uh, new, new york, york on, okay on, uh, okay yeah. wow so over lunch money you were knifed wow. yes <laughs> at the age of eight <laughs> rough did, neighborhood did you get seriously hurt um i i, I took the knife and my uh left arm um uh, you know police got involved and all that sort of stuff and uh yeah, you know, it, it was kids fighting, but you know, really silly stuff. But there you go. Wow, wow, that's wow. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, normally here, um, normally I like to have the author give a bio about themselves, but uh, I'm gonna do things kind of a a little different. Uh, I got some fan questions submitted in um, from different fans. And some of them I think are actually good ways to get to know you as an author. So I'm going to actually go with fan questions instead of asking you for your bio. Um, okay. The first question I wanted, uh, to go with was from, I hope I say his name wrong. I mean, right, not wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to say it wrong. Stefan Bowles told me how to say his name and I'm, I, I'm pro I don't remember. I think it's Seamus. Colgan? Oh, Seamus? Seamus? Shame, Seamus, Seamus. Irish name. Okay. Seamus wants to know, um, who is your favorite science fiction author? He said growing up, he loved the Dune saga himself, um, and those original books from Frank Herbert are still hard to beat in his opinion. So he was wondering, what are some? who's, who's your favorite science fiction author? Yeah, well, I've got several, but I'd say the standout would definitely be uh, Philip K. Dick. Um, I've read a lot of his work, and his writing has definitely influenced a lot of uh, my books. I've even done some uh, tribute pieces to him, um, such as uh, Little Green Men was uh, a tribute piece to Philip K. Dick. Um, uh, even things like uh, The Road to Hell were heavily influenced by uh, his writing. So, yeah, um, that was one I really enjoyed. I, I liked the quirky Twilight Zone style stories that he would come up with and just found them utterly fascinating. And I still do. You know, some of his stories like uh, Enter the Wub, uh, you know, I still think are just uh, brilliant. You know, they, they'll probably never get any airtime or turned into a movie, but very clever, very insightful. Other authors would be... Um, uh, Michael Crichton uh, and um, uh, people like Carl Sagan. So I've actually got his novel Contact. I'm taking that on holiday with me next month uh, to reread uh, while I'm up the coast. Oh, nice. I haven't read that one. I've seen the movie. I, I watched the movie after Jason Gurley told me about it, um, but I haven't read the book. How's the book compared to the movie? It is different, so I won't spoil it. It's worth getting the book. Um, and the detail that the book goes into and, um, and, and the writing is brilliant. I mean, you just, you would not think it was Carl Sagan's first and I think his only attempt at fiction. It's sublime how good it is. I mean, you know, I, I take my hat off. I think it's just brilliant. Now, growing up, were you a big reader growing up or is that something you got a love for later in life? Um, I, I, I would tend to read shorter pieces, but uh, I did enjoy a lot of the classics, which is kind of strange, I guess, for you know a, a sort of a teenager. But you know, I, I really loved like Frankenstein, uh, Dracula, you know, all of these books where the English was a little bit older, um, and 
you know, didn't flow perhaps as easily as some modern writing. But for me, that made it very much a period piece. You know, it sort of dragged me back to the time in which it was written and, uh, you know, gave it more plausibility and um, things like that. So, yeah, big, big fan of H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, um, uh, Jules Verne, From Earth to the Moon, things like this. Uh, you know, and, and the, the clunky writing style never bothered me because, like I said, it sort of helped set the Victorian era and just made the novels more living for me. So, Well, you have been um... – I guess as an indie author, you have been very, I guess you could say very active. You have been in some of the major anthologies that are out there. Samuel Peralta's Future Chronicles, you've been in several of those. Um, you've been in the Explorations um, that's out there. You've also been, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, uh, in Daniel Arthur Smith's Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, as well as your own stories. So uh, Seamus and Chris also wanted to know, how do you keep up with your tremendous workload and are you a full-time writer now or do you have a job? Um, I have a job. So I, I work for a company called Jadius um, as a developer um, working on a, a IT suite called ServiceNow. So doing a lot of work with large organizations to deploy um, IT business management and things like this. In terms of workload, I, I don't get through nearly as much as I'd like to. I've always got four or five books on the go, and I often joke that the only form of writer's block I suffer from has uh, 78% cocoa in it, <laughs> being, <laughs> being chocolate bars. <laughs> um, I find writing very therapeutic and relaxing. I, I enjoy getting in the moment. I love the challenge of weaving together a story. I'm always trying to... Uh, better myself. I, I, you know, I'd like to think my best book is always the next one and always one ahead of me. And, uh, you know, I, I look to learn a lot from other writers, um, you know, what they do well. And, and, and even, you know, perhaps at, at times where they, where they might, um, you know, fall for common cliches or stereotypes and just sort of, you know, be aware of that creeping into my own uh, writing styles. So you said you like to think, each of the book you release is better than, than the previous one you released. Um, do you change your writing style for each story to get better? Or how do you go about making each story better than the last? I, th I think it's gradual change. You've got to be very um, honest with your own writing. And that's probably one of the toughest things for an author is – a, seeing their writing afresh, and B, uh, being constructively critical of it. So um, when I'm writing, a lot of times I'll listen to my books being read back to me by the computer. That helps me to sort of see it uh, from the perspective of somebody reading it for the first time. You know, it's, it's easy to imagine what you think you've written, but it's not really what's coming across on the page, you know, because you've got more context, you know what's coming up, you know what you intended. Um, so, you know, it, it is a real challenge for writers to get in that headspace where you can read your book with a fresh uh, perspective. <laughs> and then I look to, um, you know, try to understand my uh, faults and shortcomings. All, all writers have them. They all have, uh, you know, crutches and go-to phrases and things like this. And uh, my editor, Alan Campbell, is always sending me through lists saying, you know, okay, you know, and, and they're, they're dynamic. They're never the same from one book to the next. She'll sort of go, you know, you're working this phrase a little bit too much, you know. She'll give me limits. You can say this only three times in 100,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Chris Freed also wanted to know, um, since you're kind of known as a, as a science fiction author, he wants to know, when did you become interested in science? Was it as a child or when you got older? Um, it was definitely when I got older. Um, I've had to essentially reinvent myself at a personal level. I was a, uh, a Christian preacher for a quarter of a century, you know, 25 years. That's a huge part of uh, life. And the group that I was involved with was very controlling, very autocratic um, 
and was heavily into concepts like creationism and things like that and and uh, very suspicious of science you know you know science was something that wasn't understood and if you don't understand something it's a little scary and things like this and um, uh, you know and so uh, it's looking back now it's hard to <laughs> imagine I was ever in that headspace but I was and there was a there was a teaching I heard where uh, the very passionate, sincere, well-meaning, but ultimately misguided um, preacher uh, was talking about, you know, evil in the world and, uh, you know, and was name dropping things and name dropped, you know, Adolf Hitler and Charles Darwin. And at the time I thought, OK, well, I know a lot about Hitler and, you know, it's pretty clear cut, you know, if you if you don't think Hitler was a bad guy. You really don't understand history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Killing millions of people in a world war, you know, massacring millions of civilians, you know, just decimating an entire continent. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's pretty clear cut. Uh, Charles Darwin sort of mentioning him in the same breath. Uh, you know, that was, um, that I, I just thought, you know, I, I really, I don't know anything about Charles Darwin. And so, I grabbed a copy of On the Origin of Species, and I thought, you know, um, I, I, I need to be honest with myself. I need to make sure that I, uh, you know, understand and, and, and decide for myself whether I agree with, you know, the moral equivalence of Darwin and Hitler. Uh, and, and so I started reading On the Origin of Species, and I've got two copies of it now. I've got a 1901 edition um, oh, wow. uh, from, from Harvard and... And then a, a close friend of mine brought me a beautifully illustrated um, large edition as well. So, you know, I've gone through the book now, I think, probably four or five times. And, and it was really uh, Darwin's origin of the species that opened my eyes to what science really is. And um, not only reading the book, but I went off and uh, read a lot of the letters that he had written to people, you know, um, after his death. Uh, the letters that he wrote were compiled and published as books. And and, and as, as I love that period of writing and, you know, Mary Shelley and H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, I found it very easy to consume. And there was, um, uh, there was one letter that he wrote, I think it was to um, Hook, but he was reflecting back on, his career and his time on the HMS Beagle. And, and this is what he said. I've actually got it um, here in front of me. Okay. I was so struck with the distribution of the Galapagos organisms that I was determined to collect blindly every sort of fact which might bear in any way on what are species. At last, gleams of light have come, and I am almost convinced quite to the contrary of the opinion I started with, that species are not, and this is like confessing a murder, immutable. And, and so that was something he said in a letter, and it really struck me because I felt the same way. You know, here I was considering the possibility that uh, species hadn't been created, that species were not immutable or unchangeable, and it was getting me to question the teachings that I'd been given uh, and it felt to me like confessing murder as well. <laughs> uh, and, and so I saw in Charles Darwin the kind of honesty I was looking for in life. I, you know, I saw in Charles Darwin the, the genuine uh, sense of inquiry and curiosity and the desire to investigate and, and understand and to you know, think about things in a fresh and clear way. Um, and it was it was refreshing. And of course, I did not see Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I, didn't, right. I didn't see anything that had any kind of moral equivalence with uh, Nazi regimes. Uh, Darwin goes on to say here, I think that I have found, and here's presumption, the simple way which species become exquisitely adapted to various ends. Now, you will groan and think to yourself, oh, what man and fool have I been wasting my time writing to? Five years ago, I would have thought the same. So 
you know, Darwin's uh, honesty was just a breath of fresh air. And, you know, he sought to understand the natural world around him. He sought to um, look at the evidence and to develop his theory based on um, the natural world. And I, I just found that utterly um, fascinating. And so that sort of led me to look at science without blinkers on, without, you know, the, you know, the rose colored glasses of religion, uh, you know, blurring my thinking. And uh, ever since then, I haven't looked back. And so when I write science fiction, I always try to make science the hero in some way. I, li I like to keep the science very positive, um, uh, you know, uh, try to keep it as accurate as possible. And also to, um, you know, make sure that the people really gain an appreciation for uh, science in a positive light, because it really underpins every aspect of our lives. We, uh, I, I think probably one of the great, um, you know, one of the great shames of our day and our age is how little science is appreciated. Um, you know, if it weren't for things like the advent of um, antibiotics and like penicillin, um, you know, uh, vaccines uh, for, you know, polio and smallpox, um, you know, the advent of uh, things like refrigeration for food and, you know, um, uh, our world would just be entirely different. You know, um, I, I went to a, a uh, musical production a couple of years ago that was looking at the life of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach and it was going through his life and showing pieces from all different periods of his life. And I was shocked to find out he had eight children, uh, you know, only two of which survived to adulthood. Oh, wow. You, you know, I mean, and that was normal for that day. Uh, you know, he was married twice. His first wife died, died in childbirth. You know, it, we just have lost the sight of, everything that science has uh, accomplished to improve our quality of life to no end. So when I write, I, you know, I, I try to bring science to the forefront in that way to um, help people appreciate it a bit more and to, and, you know, and to um, not lose sight of that. Yeah. I was, I guess I was kind of like you in a way when I grew up, um, I wasn't much into science growing up. Um, it was actually one of my worst subjects when I was in school. I had, I had such a hard time with science, but w once I've gotten older, it's so fascinating to to learn about how stuff works. And uh, I mean, just, just oh man, uh, is it Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel? One of them has this scientist that will come on and do science experiments and and show how stuff works. And those are just so fun to watch because it's just like, wow, why did I not get into this when I was younger? Um, well, I guess the the science research and everything kind of takes us to your your newest novel, Retrograde, which just actually just, just came out yesterday um, on September 12th. Well, I guess before we, we start talking about the novel, can you give my listeners the non-spoiler book blurb on what Retrograde is about? Sure. Um, I'm reading from the blurb on the back of the book here. Okay. Humanity's greatest undertaking has been to establish a permanent colony on another planet, extending life beyond Earth. After the exhilaration of reaching the surface of Mars, public interest has waned as the exploration of the red planet moves into its scientific phase. With cosmic rays bombarding the surface, the only viable means of long-term habitation lies beneath the planet in lava tubes. Liz, Connor, and Harrison are senior members of the U.S. module. When a nuclear war breaks out on Earth and rumors spread among the different nationalities colonizing Mars, they find their core principles tried and tested. The loss of family and friends back home weighs heavily on everyone. Who can you trust when your countries are at war? Grief and anger become pitted against camaraderie as the crew of the international colony struggle with their allegiance to each other and the mission. One of the uh, questions I kind of wanted to, to ask you since uh, the book takes place on Mars, I think one thing that made Andy Weir's novel, The Martian, so 
popular is well, one thing I enjoyed about it was uh, the science of how he did stuff on Mars to survive. Um, so what kind of research did you have to do for your for retrograde um, in order to make your science feel realistic? Yeah, so uh, retrograde and, and the Martian are different. In the Martian, it is very much applied science, you know, like, you know, the botany and growing the potatoes and things like this. In retrograde, science is more um, – part of the setting so it's about understanding you know what the surface of mars would be like what you know the challenges of uh you know being in temperatures up to you know negative 180 degrees and things like this um and so yeah i, I do a lot of background research um into what life would be like on mars i had the opportunity to correspond with uh dr andrew rader from spacex uh who's uh a Mars enthusiast and has written several books about uh, living life on Mars and has um, a number of YouTube videos along those lines as well. And also got to chat with um, uh, Ben Honey, one of the flight controllers for the International Space Station over in Houston. And so I was able to bounce a lot of ideas off them and you know talk about some of the practical challenges you would have, um, you know, uh, trying to run a colony at such a huge distance and there's things that you just wouldn't uh, necessarily consider you know like uh, internet bandwidth for example you know just trying to get data between the two planets um, would be incredibly challenging and you know it would have to be prioritized it'd be broken into different streams and things like video would be the lowest stream of all because you know it uses so much data it's a it's a hog um, and, you know, so text messages are going to have a higher priority because you can get more information through in a shorter amount of time. Uh, you have less problems with, um, you know, data integrity and things like this. So, it, and, and a lot of that is just woven into the the background of the book. It's not really discussed at length, It's but the decisions the characters are making and, you know, is often dependent upon those kinds of factors. Did did they say anything about how fast the internet connection might even be on Mars if there was a colony set up? Well, the limit is the speed of light. So, um, you know, between Earth and Mars, depending on where we are in the uh, various orbits, um, you know, that can be anywhere from about six minutes to 35 minutes for a round trip. So a lot of stuff would be done using what's called caching servers, where information would be pushed down in advance. And, you know, if you want to look at the news, for example, you could look at yesterday's news, but you'd have to wait for today's. You you couldn't actually sit on a browser and, uh, you know, uh, type in Facebook because, you know, the round trip, uh, you know, transmission for that could be 12 minutes or over an hour just to get the page to load. So, you know, wow. it uh, – it kind of makes the, uh, you know, the the dial-up modems look uh, desirable. So, <laughs> yeah. so they would, so they would use a lot of caching to, um, you know, uh, uh, have things um, at either end to to try to minimize that impact. Was there anything uh, you learned during your research that really surprised you? Um, there, there were lots of. I think it's mainly that Mars isn't just a desert. You know, we, we sort of see pictures of it and you see movies and sure enough, you know, there's some guy in a spacesuit and he's walking around a desert. You know, um, Mars is actually uh, a bit of a time capsule. You've got erosion that has happened over billions of years. You've got all this evidence for water, you know, these uh, washed out riverbeds and things like this. And Mars is sort of an entire package. You can't just look at one aspect of it. So you've got things like um, the the planet itself is only about a third the size of Earth. So if you're standing on a on a hill, you would be able to visibly see the curvature of the planet. Oh wow! Uh, you know, which is something you can't really. It's not as obvious here on Earth, but if you're on Mars, you would definitely notice it because it'd be such a striking difference. Um, you've got things like in the lower gravity 
uh, you know, it, the gravity on Mars is closer to that of what you see on the moon than it is on Earth. So astronauts would bunny hop, for example. Um, once they were inside the confines of a uh, module or a base and they no longer need to wear their spacesuit, um, it would be quite surreal. Uh, just simple motions would be astonishingly different. You know, you could drop a pen and it would fall like a feather on Earth. Or um, when you're walking, the very process of stepping involves, you know, you using your muscles to rise up and then allowing gravity to pull you down. And walking itself is, you know, falling and catching yourself. Uh, on Mars, that would feel clumsy because the, the gravity element is uh, roughly about a third. So, you know, it would take some time to acclimatize to just something as simple as walking. Oh, wow. uh, and, and so you, you really would get the sense that everything is alien. Everything is foreign. You know, nothing is the same. And of course, that has a psychological impact on you. you know, I remember the first winter I spent in the United States. Um, I grew up in New Zealand and you know, would spend time in Australia. And our winters were just, you know, a rainy summer, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the first winter I had, you, you're exposed to this intense cold, you know, very dry snow, gloomy skies all the time. And when the first buds of spring appeared at the end of winter, I, you know, it, it blew me away. I had no idea how my world had become almost black and white. And, and, I, and I tried to capture some of that in the novel because there'll be the same kind of contrast to life on Mars. You know, it, it's such an austere and harsh environment and so radically different in so many different ways that it's going to have a psychological impact just like um, you know, a, a cold, dark, snowy winter does, and then you know, summer rolls around, and you know, life seems to blossom and explode around people again. So, you know, it, it, it for me, it was seeing Mars as this whole package rather than just you know, some guy stumbling around in the desert wearing a spacesuit. Um. So after you did your your research for for retrograde did you have to go back and redo any of the story because the science just didn't work the original way that you thought it uh no there was a lot of tweaking so um yeah you know some of the scientists that would read it would provide feedback and you know talk about things like you know um you know beware of things like line of sight uh limitations on you know different types of radio and things like this you know as soon as you sort of disappear over the horizon, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna lose contact and things like this. You know, you just don't have all this sort of supporting infrastructure we take for granted here on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the um, one of the interesting things about the book uh, sort of came out after I'd um, been contacted by John Joseph Adams and and he'd picked up the book on behalf of uh, HMH. Um, was, uh, you know, just the involvement of other people. So when you're writing, writing's a very lonely process. It's you and a computer screen and you're just, you know, you're in the zone and, you know, you send off drafts every now and then you get some feedback, but it's, you know, it's really just you and, you know, a blank sheet of paper. Um, but, you know, having the uh, privilege of working with uh, John Joseph Adams, who's a, a Hugo Award-winning author, multiple Hugo Award-winning author, mm -hmm. um, then the cover was designed by uh, Elizabeth Leggett, who's uh, also a Hugo Award-winning artist. Oh, okay. And, and, and then um, uh, John passed the book on to a couple of my uh, idols uh, in the scientific world, Ben Bova and Robert J. Sawyer. Uh, ben Bova, of course, was the editor of, I think it was Analog Magazine back in the 70s. I used to read it back then. Um, He's, you know, written parts of the series, um, uh, a couple of TV series. I'm, I'm forgetting the names of them now, but you know, to have uh, people like Ben and Robert uh, read the book and then provide quotes, you know, just blew my mind. It, it was, you know, at the time I was writing it, you know, I never imagined it would get into their hands or that they'd enjoy it. Um, so, you know, that was very humbling. 
and so you know all these all all this tremendous talent and this tremendous experience sort of supporting the book has just been you know overwhelming it's you know it's it's uh, been a very humbling experience because you know uh, most of my books are just um written uh, edited published and you know then sit out there for people to enjoy so it's uh, it's been quite something to you know g- get feedback from the likes of Ben Bover and Robert J Sawyer how did how did you go about or how did it go about that retrograde ended up getting picked up um by HMH i guess my other question is are they kind of a small a small press or, or are they a little bit bigger than i'm thinking they are um, yeah, so uh, they're actually quite a big uh, company. They just don't do a lot in terms of fiction. So HMH is uh, Horton, Milton, Harcourt, and they're predominantly education and learning resources. And they partnered with John Joseph Adams um, to form a science fiction imprint. And, you know, some of the people that are with them is uh, Hugh Howie Sand and Wool, I think, are both with them. Oh, okay. um, Hughes just released a short story, short story series called Machine Learning. That's with them. Uh, there's an anthology that comes out each year called The Best of American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, they've got a number of other books like uh, Bannerless by Carrie Vaughan, um, uh, Creatures of Will and Temper by Molly Trancer. So they're, I, I guess, um, a large company um, backing a new arm of uh, science science fiction uh, publishing. So what was the process like getting picked up by them? Did did you present the story to them? What what was that process like? Yeah, uh, so John and I have known each other for a few years. I, I forget how we sort of met, just um, electronically uh, in the ether of the interwebs at some point, and I'd run a few short stories by him, and he He'd always, uh, you know, he'd read them and come back and, nah, not right for me. Not, you know, nice story, but uh, wrong timing or, you know, not not the sort of uh, audience he was after or the, you know, the material that he he, he um, uh, could use in his um, uh, magazines. Uh, and um, I sent him a copy of Retrograde, which at the time was called Mars Endeavor. And he read the first chapter and loved it. Uh, and said, you know, look, I, I really, um, you know, thoroughly enjoyed this and I uh, think it could uh, really work at a, at a broader level. And so being an independent writer, uh, you know, for me, it's an opportunity to, you know, reach out to a broader market because, uh, you know, one of the challenges for indies is uh, it's very much like shouting on a crowded train, you know, or, or shouting at a rock concert. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? yeah. You, you might get a few people nearby that go, oh, hey, nice to meet you, but you know, you, you're just not going to um, get any real exposure. Um, so, yeah, so I was, I was very keen. And, and then he worked with me to refine some of the content. Um, and, you know, and I just you know, found it a privilege to work with him. Um, Alan Campbell had done the initial editing and uh, refined the, the novel. And then uh, John was able to, provide essentially um, a development review where he would go through and he would say, you know, can you clarify this, you know, perhaps look to um, expand these characters, you know, does this conversation make sense? And, you know, coming from a Hugo award winning editor, uh, there was nothing I was going to knock back. <laughs> right, like, right, right. You know, but, <laughs> that doesn't work for you. Let's make it work. That's right. Uh, and, and so I think the story is really strong before that, and I think it's a you know it's really quite refined and polished now, and um, is better for the collaboration. So you know, so I'm thrilled by you know being able to uh, you know break out of the you know the isolation of writing, if you like, and um, you know get you know feedback. Um, uh, I think Ken Liu, uh, you know, another just tremendous author, he provided a lot of insights into some of the Chinese culture and, uh, you know, that's portrayed in the book. And again, you know, it was just uh, invigorating and refreshing to have that level of support because I've, you know, I've just never had that with any of my other books. Do you have an excerpt from the, um, from retrograde that you could read so our listeners can kind of uh, hear what it sounds like? 
Sure. Uh, so this is an excerpt, and I've, I've tried to pick a section that won't have any spoilers in it and also doesn't have uh, too much, uh, you know, require too much understanding of um, other aspects of the story, you know, so it doesn't sound too out of context. Um, just to provide the setting before I start reading, the protagonist, Liz, is following a lava tube and uh, wanting to backtrack to get into the uh, base through, you know, sort of the basement level. And so she's following uh, outbound footprints and she's going in the opposite direction. She's, um, you know, coming in from the outside and, you know, in danger of being lost in this labyrinth of um, lava tunnels. And and she gets lost. <laughs> so this is how she, okay. <laughs> this is how she, this is how she goes here. Um, Dust churns in response to my motion, shifting off the rocks and stirring like silt being lifted by a cave diver. On those occasions when I pause to find my way, the cloud caught in my wake drifts around my waist. My spotlights are largely ineffective as the dust is like fog. It's as fine as cigarette smoke, swirling as though it were suspended in water. If I don't keep moving, there's a danger I'll lose track of the footprints and get lost. Being stuck beneath the surface of Mars with limited oxygen and no clear exit doesn't exactly thrill me. Normally, I'd have a guide rope to lead me back to the surface. My heart pounds in my chest and I have to fight to remain calm. The darkness is impenetrable. My spotlights are feeble, barely illuminating the next few feet. But on I go, following the faint outline of boot prints in the dust. The lava tunnel is confusing as there's no visual clues to guide me. No right angles, no straight sections, no flat regions. I'm sweating, working hard as I climb over rocks and boulders. I lose sight of the outbound footprints and I'm gripped by panic. My throat constricts. I rush, scrambling forward. Nothing but dust and volcanic debris unchanged after hundreds of millions of years in the darkness. Retrograde is available uh, Amazon, and I'm assuming every other place that you like to buy books from. So definitely go and check that check retrograde out. Um, I have asked questions from almost every fan that we have received questions for. I haven't gotten to all of them. Um, and I want to ask one from James A. Carter the third. Um, he's the only one or he's one of the ones I haven't asked a question from yet. And I want to make sure I at least get one of his in. Sure. Um, so he he says, I thoroughly enjoyed Anomaly. I recently read and enjoyed um, Archangel Down series by C. Uh, Gokul, which also dealt with first contact themes. And, uh, he goes on to say, science fiction themes seem to have centered a lot on alien contact, especially in film like Ender's Game and Avatar, just to name two. Do you believe this is to satisfy our need to seek a higher power? whether benign or hostile, because our world seems to be in, in chaos? Yeah, good question. Um, we're a social species. Uh, it's the only way we survive. You know, if you look at humans, uh, homo sapiens, we don't have the sharpest claws or the biggest teeth, the strongest bite or, you know, the, the fastest running or anything like that. You know, our only strength is in numbers. It's, it's in using our intelligence and banding together as a society. Um, and I think that is probably the underlying um, driver behind an interest in wanting to find intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. If you roll back the clock and instead of thinking about extraterrestrials, you know, imagine, you know, the dark ages uh, in Europe and the exploration of, um, you know, various people like um, Magellan or uh, Columbus, um, you know, even Darwin and uh, the, on, on the Beagle or you know, Captain James Cook, you know, these were people that, you know, sought to explore. They wanted to understand the world around them and they wanted to reach out and make connections. You know, they heard about these far flung lands and, and, you know, the desire I think of, um, uh, humans is to be a little restless and, and to seek the unknown, to want to understand and, 
and very much to uh, you know want to connect. And so I think that is some of the basis of it. Um, in terms of aliens, yeah, you know, and I've, I've clearly written a lot about this. I've even you know, written you know UFOs found stories and things like this. I, I don't think you can underestimate just how vast space is and how huge a distance there is to cover. You know, just in our solar system, you know, um, getting a probe to Saturn or uh, Jupiter takes decades. And, and these things are traveling at phenomenal speeds. And, you know, this, and that's only covering a small fraction of the actual size of the solar system as a whole. And when you start talking light years, it can be deceptive because you, you know, the numbering drops, you know, Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years away and 4.3 is a small number to us, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, in terms of physical travel, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, it, it, it represents challenges on a scale that we just can't even really uh, comprehend at the moment, you know, to, you know, if, if we um, were to send a probe there, uh, you know, it would take 50 to 80,000 years to arrive and things like this. So, you know, I, I don't think we'll have aliens turning up on our doorstep anytime soon. Um, however, I, I have written stories where, um, and again, sort of based on the science, where thinking about if we see another world, um, there's the you know the the way aliens will probably be discovered is through spectro uh, spectro analysis. So looking at a planet and seeing what chemistry is active there and uh, doing the sums to figure out you know is this um, you know natural or you know is there something biological that is you know causing the particular signature that we're ob observing. And so the reverse is definitely true, you know, an alien civilization could have looked at Earth a hundred million years ago and seen algae blooms from space. You know, that's something that would be quite apparent uh, to any alien species, um, you know, watching Earth transit the sun, you know, they, they would be able to pick out things like that. Um, and, you know, and so they, you know, they could have potentially sent uh, a mission that you know arrives only now, you know, sort of thing. So um, there are ways that the immense distances can be overcome, but um, but nothing like what we see in Hollywood of you know uh, sort of near time or real time travel. Uh, he also asked, um, and I don't know if I've ever really heard this question asked much. Asked much. Um, James also asks uh, earlier sci fi seems to be a lot more hard theme based on big physics concepts and hypothetical science how ha or has technology jaded our view of hard science um potentialities yeah, that's a good question um hard science um you know I, I i think it's always tempting for a writer to take an easy out and ignore the science, you know, or only use the science as it works to support the story. And that's something I consciously try to avoid. If I find that, you know, the science suggests something, I try to go with it rather than to take the easy path. But yeah, it, it, in the 50s and 60s, I think there was more of a tendency to adhere to the science and try to project what would happen in the future. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of um, science just being a garnish on the side of the dish. You know, it's really not the main course. And so you get things like, you know, Prometheus, where they, uh, you know, travel halfway across the galaxy and arrive on an unexplored planet. And, you know, there's plants growing. There's clearly life. Um, and then they go, ah, oh, the air is breathable and just pop their helmets off, you know. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, no scientist would ever do that you know the the amount of investigation that would be going on would just be phenomenal you know not wanting to disturb an established ecosystem um, concern about microbial um, contamination going both ways you know we could introduce something that 
ruins that particular ecosystem as well as that ecosystem doing something that damages us. Um, so when you see science fiction, I, I think there is a lot of hand waving that happens where you know they just want a particular story to happen. They want this guy to get infected, so everybody's got to do something dumb and take their helmets off. Um, but I think that stories are richer and stronger if the writers adhere to science. And a good example was, I think, Star Trek Into Darkness. Um, in that particular movie, you know, there's one scene where Kirk is on the Klingon homeworld, I think it is, and, you know, and it's 20 light years away. And Scotty, the engineer, is on Earth, and he's sitting in a bar, and Kirk's got a, got a question about engineering. So he calls up Scotty and Scotty's sitting in the bar and he, and the two of them talk and Scotty essentially tells him how to solve his problem. Uh, and you know, that, that is science fiction, but it ignores science. Um, in reality, you could not hold a conversation at a distance of 25 light years. You know, you, we can't do it between earth and Mars, you know, let alone between right. star systems uh, because of the speed of light constraint. And you could say, well, that's been overcome, but that then raises a whole host of other problems because all of a sudden you can, you know, you're introducing time travel and things like this. So if, if I was writing that and Kirk ran into that particular problem on Klingon where he needed that engineering knowledge and Scotty had it and he's back on Earth, I would use that to drive the story forward. I, I would go, okay, well, he can lament the fact that, you know, if Scotty was here, he'd just be able to answer this question, bam, like that. Um, and now Kirk's going to have to do an Andy Weir's um, Mark Watney and science the crap out of things. You know, he's going to have <laughs> right. to, you know, it, so it actually strengthens the story when you adhere to the science because you don't get the cheap out. You don't get the easy pass. You know, you've got to work a bit harder to um, – you know, by staying plausible. So I, I think when writers uh, take shortcuts the, of convenience, they weaken the story uh, and, and, that, and they don't do themselves or their audience justice. You know, there's, you know, if, if they go back to the old school style of, you know, adhering to the science and not slavishly so, but, but keeping it plausible, um, there'll be better stories for it. Um, and so, you know, Prometheus, uh, you know, or Star Trek Into Darkness, you know, they, they're they fun popcorn movies, but they'll, they won't be icons of cinema. They won't be icons of sci-fi for, you know, decades to come when with a little bit of attention to some of those scientific details, they perhaps could, um, you know, you look at 2001 A Space Odyssey and, you know, it was groundbreaking, um, but it was also thoughtful. It was also adhering to the science as it was understood in the day. And, and it stands up today. I was, I was watching 2001 A Space Odyssey with my wife just uh, a couple of nights ago. And, um, you know, we watched as the crew walk on Velcro on the floor um, to stop them floating off into space. Um, that, that was a really clever idea. Never used, as far as I know, but <laughs> <laughs> but but it was a clever idea to say, well, if you've got no gravity, how do you help people to move around? So you know, that, uh, it, it, it's it's interesting. But yeah, hard science is a bit of a misnomer. It's really not hard. It's more staying plausible. And yes, I agree with James that it improves the story and strengthens the story ultimately. There's so much more that we could go on. Um, but here at the Legendarium uh, in 30-minute author interviews, we're kind of known for, for one question, and that question is, a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? Uh, <laughs> oh, I have no idea how to answer that question. Um <laughs> Well, I, I guess parrots can talk, and not just mimicry. You know, they, there's evidence that they understand at least some of what they're communicating. It's not just simply parroting. So, 
in theory, um, a penguin could talk. It, it, it could speak. Um, I suspect if I was sitting in the bar and the penguin walked in wearing the sombrero, I'm not sure what would surprise me more, that it can speak or that it's wearing a sombrero. <laughs> 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 That's funny. You know, I, I think you're right about the parrots. Um, my, my best friend's uh, family had, I don't know if it was parrots or what kind of birds they had, but every time the phone would ring, the bird would go, Hello, Michael, Michael, hello, Michael. So it's like is answering the phone and then calling my best friend's brother to come to the phone. So yeah, it's uh it's kinda interesting you said that. I just reminded me of that. Before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, I guess from the writing perspective, um, People, uh, writers have to be very realistic about just how difficult it is, um, you know, to publish and to get ahead. There's a tremendous amount of um, competition there. But what I've seen over the sort of seven years I've been publishing is that the competition is misplaced. You know, um, there's more than enough readers to go around if we all help each other and readers are just wonderful and supportive They're, You know, the, the, the biggest challenge I think for any new writer is getting discovered, you know, getting some airtime, getting the opportunity to grow by having their books read and getting feedback. And that's where, you know, the more that we writers can help each other, the better writing is very, and publishing is very different to other sort of uh, commercial forms. You know, if you, produce Mars bars or cans of Coke. Um, once you establish a fan for your product, you know, um, they'll keep coming back. Uh, you know, you, these things are highly consumable. You can have one Mars bar, you can have 10. Uh, with books, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, once someone buys the book <laughs> once, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they can come back for more books, but the real key, I think, to succeeding as a writer is getting that broad spread base where you're working with other writers to reach other readers. You know, there's there are, there are fans of mine that would love to hear about uh, other similar writers, and I'm sure other writers have fans that would love to hear about my writing. And there's plenty for everybody. There's more than enough to go around. Um, and so, yeah, in, in my um, emails, I, I try to add a indie spotlight to sort of, uh, you know, help uh, other writers to be heard and, and give readers the opportunity to learn about other writers. And one of the things I love about uh, Amazon is the ability to grab the samples. I, I get hundreds of samples on my Kindle and you know, we'll go through and, and read them. And I might only pick, you know, two or three that I then go on to read the entire novel up for, but they're, they're wonderful ways to sample other writers and to sort of find what fits for me, find what works for me and what really gets my interest. Um, so, yeah, I, I think even though there is huge competition, you can look at that in a positive way and realize that, you know, there's actually tremendous opportunity for readers and writers to work together to help each other yeah definitely um well we have uh one last fan question i'm going to ask you because it, it fits in i think best here it's from colby zoller um and colby wants to know what are you working on now um and what ideas will be coming to life in the future oh wow um so i've i've got five books that i'm working on at the moment um um, I'm about halfway through the sequel to Retrograde, which is called Reentry. Um, it follows the story, uh, basically that's outlined in the epilogue of the book, um, and sort of takes things in an entirely new direction. So that'll that'll be really good. Um, I've got a novel called Three Ezekiel, which I'm working on. So it's the biblical name Ezekiel, but with a three instead of the e and there's a little clue there in the title as to what it's about, but we'll, I won't give you any spoilers. Um, but the, the story is set in the Congo, and it's a first contact novel uh, set in the middle of the jungle. So that, that, um, 
that's what I'm very excited about. I just don't have enough time. I, I, could, write, I could write all day. Um, yeah. I've got one called Apothecary, which is uh, first contact set in the 1500s. Um, oh, wow. And that's uh, that. there's some really interesting material there looking at just how entrenched superstition was. You know, it's it's really the, the birth of science was in the 1500s. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's quite fascinating to think about what it would have been like if first contact had occurred then and perhaps had not been noticed, had been missed. Um, and so, again, trying to get something that has a high degree of plausibility, um, is true to the time period, um, and looks at how aliens would uh, investigate and explore our world at a time where we had were ruled by superstition and were really just emerging as a species that would um, go on to uh, you know have a scientific understanding of the universe. Um, so that's that's another one I'm really excited about. Um, another one is Lies Incorporated, a limited liability company. Uh, that's a story about time traveling assassins. So that's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I've got, uh, I've got, a, I've got a really nice solution to the grandfather paradox. You know, there's this paradox when it comes to time travel that time travel is impossible because you can't go back and kill your grandfather. Um, mm-hmm. It would set up this paradox, and I've come up with a intriguing solution to it that I'm going to weave into the book. So I think that'll that'll be a lot of fun. Um, gosh, I'm trying, there, there's at least two more. Um, I'm just trying to remember what they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds like you got some good ones coming out and then the works. I can't believe you can work on so many books at one time. That's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh, the, the other one is uh, Phobos and that's about a mining disaster set around Mars. Um, and then I've got, uh, I'd, I'd like to do an anthology along the lines of, um, the twilight zone. So I'm, thinking about doing eight to 10 short stories all in that sort of twilight zone genre. Um, I've got two short stories coming out. Mirror Mirror will be in the Halloween edition of Canyons of the Dam. That's a really good story. And I've got a story called Butch and Sundance, which is coming out in one of uh, Chris Kennedy's uh, anthologies in the sort of mech universe. Oh, nice. So, yeah, those are both uh, with editors at the moment. And, yeah, so lots to come. It's um, just a matter of getting some time to work on them all. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, Where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you and the stories that you've written? Uh, Yeah, so search for uh, author Peter Cordron on Facebook or Twitter um, or on uh, Amazon. You, You can find all my books on Amazon. Well, we will throw links to all of those over in the show notes at uh, legendarium.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day and uh, coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Sorry for going so long over time. Oh, it's a, no, no problem. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to our interview with Peter Cauldron, and I hope you tune in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for another great author interview. And don't forget that once this outro is over, I have 20 more minutes of interview footage with Peter Cauldron. And don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you're going to find the link to Trixie and Me, the free story that you can get on Amazon from Peter Cauldron. And also in the show notes, you're going to find the link to our sponsors, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, and also Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam. Check them out and let them know that you heard about them right here on 30-Minute Author Interviews. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Third Scribe, Maggie Stewart-Grant, and Nick Breaker. They're supporting 30-Minute Author Interviews through Patreon. They are also receiving the Patreon-only podcast, 10 Questions With. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews for as little as a dollar a month. Until next time, stay legendary.
I did have a quick question for you. Um, not, not for the podcast. Um, I know most of your novels are kind of like standalones. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are, I'm just, I guess I'm curious because of the way the covers look. Are Free Fall, Hello World, and Alien Space Tentacle Porn, are those all interconnected any? No, they're just all very dark covers. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, <laughs> I was just curious because, like I said, w- w- with the covers, it looks like they can almost go together. But um, free f- uh, I've actually just ch- recently changed the covers of three books that are related. So Freefall is a sequel to What We Left Behind. Okay. And then, and then um, All Our Tomorrows is the third book. Free Falls a short story. It's about 10,000 words long, and it's about an astronaut arriving back in orbit around Earth after a zombie apocalypse has broken out. Okay. And so he's, he's you know, Houston, is there anybody there? <laughs> right. And there's no one. You know, there's, and and he, he gets in contact with a girl, in a, a young girl trapped in a, um, in a police station on a, on a ham radio and she sort of talks him through what's happened and she's panicked. You know, there's zombies trying to break in and kill her. Um, <laughs> so it's a really fun story. So that's free fall. And then okay. that leads into two stories about her, which is what we left behind and all our tomorrows, which is her as a teenager, if you like. Um, but those, that, that, I think that's the only, the only books where I've done sequels. Uh, other than this one that I'm working on at the moment, which is re-entry as the sequel to Retrograde. It, it, it's funny. Um, and if you're recording this, you're welcome to use any of this if you want. But okay. when writing, um, you know, writing influences is, is an interesting topic. There's stories I want to write, and then there's stories that I write for a different reason. So something like Maelstrom, was written because I was contacted by a um, uh, by a publishing uh, by a, um, a a film publisher who asked for a very specific story that I would never have otherwise written. They wanted a story set in China about parallel worlds colliding um, with you know uh, uh, with a American um, lead character. And I would never have written that book if it, if I hadn't been pushed in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, the same is true with um, Reentry, which is the sequel to Retrograde. Um, uh, John Joseph Adams asked for a sequel, and he said, "Look, you've got to continue with this story. You've got to, we've got to see where this goes." Um, and now that I'm halfway through the book, I'm loving it. I'm like, wow, this is really going to some interesting places. But I would never have attempted it if I hadn't have sort of been pushed. So there's some stories where there are ideas that I'm passionate about and I really want to explore. And then there's these other ones where there's external influences that sort of drive the story and push it. Um, so it, it's kind of I, I find that interesting, you know, that there's. Uh, a, a couple of my stories that just wouldn't have been written otherwise. Right. So, yeah. So, so did you, so did you come up with the idea for retrograde on your own or was that something that you were asked to write? Uh, no. So retrograde was something that I came up with, but the sequel reentry, um, yeah, that was, that's, that's sort of taken things in, a, in an entirely different direction. It's something I, I, if the book, if retrograde hadn't been picked up by John Joseph Adams, you know there would be no uh, reentry. I would have just left it as a standalone book. Oh, really? Okay. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, I guess in a way that's that's kind of like um, when uh, Samuel Peralta put out um, was it the the robot? Oh yeah, robot yeah. chronicles. Yeah, um, it had W J Davies in it. And he wrote, um, he wrote the story uh, "Empathy for Andrew," and it was a short, you know, short little story on you know what happened if uh, a robot had was it had feelings or could think or something like that. Um, and I got done reading that that story, and I, I I put down the Robot Chronicles and just started messaging 
WJ Davies online, found him online, shot him some messages. We went back and forth. And I was, you know, and in, in, in the process, I, I asked him, I said, um, do you plan on writing a novel? Do you plan on writing a sequel to your short story? And he said he hadn't really thought about it. Um, he's like, why did you have ideas? And I was like, well, man, you know, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. I mean, you, well, what about here? You could do this. And he ended up writing a novel on that. Um, it's, it's kind of fun because I'm, you know, it was like dedicated to Preston. I was like, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> um, I'm not sure if he would have written that, you know. I don't know if he would have written a novel if I hadn't asked him about it. Yeah. So um, it's kind of fun to hear, kind of fun to hear where influences are. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've got the same thing with um, Nosferatu. So I, I wrote a one-off short story called Vampire, which was just supposed to be a quirky look at um, some of the Bram Stoker material and never really intended anything to go for it. And then I had, a number of fans saying you've got to write a sequel and so then i wrote a sequel and these were short stories and then you've got to finish this story <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I've, I've packaged all three into this one book nosferatu now um mm. and i'm so glad i did you know it, it, but i wouldn't have done it if it hadn't have been for um a number of people sort of saying look you know this is this is really resonating you know please continue yeah um, I don't think I asked you in the podcast. So, so what was it that that influenced uh, your new novel, Retrograde? What influenced it was, and again, yeah, you're welcome to use any of this, but the um, the influence behind Retrograde was movies like uh, Prometheus, where you get scientists making dumb decisions that they would never make. You know, I'm I'm sitting there watching Prometheus in the in the cinema and absolutely loving the, the visuals, you know, loving the special effects, you know, it, it just majestic, you know, top class. I mean, you, you see it and you're just blown away. And then to be subject to these just crazy decisions, you know, scientists taking their helmets off inside a, uh, you know, an alien structure with dead bodies lying everywhere. <laughs> you know, right, like, right. You know, hey, look, here's an alien snake. Let me poke it with my finger. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, you, know, you, you feel like shouting at the screen. It, it, it completely destroyed the suspension of disbelief. And so in writing Retrograde, what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to say, okay, well, what would shake a scientist? What would shake an astronaut? These guys have been trained and disciplined for decades working towards a certain mission. They've looked at every possible contingency. They've planned for every type of emergency. What is the one thing that could shake a colony on Mars? And I realized it was a disaster happening on Earth because it's the one thing you could never prepare for. So the whole story is set around that concept. You know, here are these scientists, they're on Mars, they've prepared for every eventuality except one, and that's what happens when disaster strikes Earth. And all of a sudden, their lifeline is cut off, and they've got to figure out how to survive on their own. Um, and then the story sort of develops from there. So it was very much a backlash or a reaction against the stupidity of um, Prometheus. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And at one point, you know, that they they openly say, okay, look, how are we going to solve this? We're scientists. This is what we do. We, you know, we solve problems. How are we going to get through this particular challenge? And and so, you know, it's, it's trying to bring some intelligence back into the story rather than uh, silly mistakes. Um, so, as a fan of science, um, as it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you know a good good bit about it. What were your thoughts on Interstellar? <laughs> oh boy what do i say <laughs> again i love the visuals mm -hmm. love the concept um but it's another one where they just they jump the shark you know i, I are you familiar with the term jump the shark uh-huh yeah so you know 
Happy Days had been running for a decade. They were running out of story ideas. So let's get Fonzie on his motorbike to jump the shark, you know. <laughs> that just goes to the ridiculous. Um, and, yeah, they, they jumped the shark on the whole um, love is the fifth dimension. Um, mm-hmm. the, there was so much that could have been done with the storyline. There some, you know, some great initial um, positioning. I, if I was a script writer in Hollywood, I would hire the guys from how it should have ended to review my scripts before they go out. Cause you know, you, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the YouTube channel, how it should have ended. Uh, it, it's, I, I might've seen one or two videos, but I'll, I'll have to look it up. They're, they're great for poking fun at all these massive plot holes, but um, it could, because some of these things are a real surprise to people. Like, for example, um, there was this fantastic movie uh, came out last year um, with uh, 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 Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt, I think it was, Passengers. Be- yeah, okay. Beautifully shot. But the whole premise of the story centered around essentially date rape. You know, <laughs> uh, the, right. you know the, it, it was Beauty and the Beast in space it was you know um how this guy can control and manipulate this woman um you know and uh, the selfishness you know and it was it had so much potential and the the irony is you know there was just one or two points at which they could have tweaked the story to avoid that entirely uh and you know and actually make it a beautiful story um if they just you know, and and the the thing was, um, neither Chris nor Jennifer realized it at the time. It wasn't until the reviews started rolling in where they go, "Holy cow!" You know, um, right? You know, so they were too close to it themselves to see it for what it was. Um, and yeah, and that that can happen to any writer. You know, it can happen to me. It, and that's where I think feedback is a really important uh, part of the writing cycle. You know. I'll, I'll um, run things by different people I know and trust and, you know, to get their feedback on something and just make sure that it works for them. And it's not, um, it's not caustic or, you know, I, I haven't, um, you know, inadvertently portrayed something in the wrong light and given the wrong message essentially. But, um, but yeah, the, the guys from how it should have ended, um, they, they quite regularly go through and dissect these different movies and, and and they're not super critical. I don't think they take it too far. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think uh, if I, if I was writing a movie script, I'd be I'd be definitely just saying, you know, what do you see here, and how can we tweak it to avoid those uh, plot inconsistencies and uh, <laughs> m- make the story more robust? How can we tweak it from ending up on your YouTube channel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't mind. I, I'm sure they'd love it. They'd be, they'd be thrilled. Yeah, um, I remember. I thought I remember reading somewhere about Passengers that the original script was. I don't know if it's centered around the same idea, but I know that they they tweaked the script and they moved some of the scenes around. And so there were people that saw the script before that loved the movie, but then they saw what was put out the the final script, and they said that they just they moved some stuff around to where it didn't have that punch like it was supposed to have um in the original script well that's that's interesting yeah Yeah. i I know with prometheus um i've read the original screenplay for it and it's very different to what ended up in the movie um and it actually resolves a lot of the problems that were in the movie the script was rewritten i think three or four times um oh really yeah and and so different elements of the story um you know sort of carry over and don't always make sense until you actually go back and read the original screenplay and you realize, Oh, okay, that's what that was going towards. And, you know, and so I think that's where the, there's a real danger with them taking to these scripts with a knife and, um, you know, and, tr- and trying to make something else out of it. Um, perhaps spend a little less on the CGI and a little more on the uh, script. <laughs> yeah, for I, sure, I, definitely I ha- for sure. I have Cauldron's Law of Movies, <laughs> which is um, 
you know, the, the, the quality of the story is inversely proportional to the amount of CGI that's there. So, you know, the, the more CGI, the worse the story is going to be. The less CGI, the, the better the story. That's why Transformers has been bombing lately, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, think, Way too much CGI. <laughs> that's right. Th- think about the original Star Wars. Think about Aliens. You know, the, these were mm. all movies that were done with props and stop motion animation and things like that. They didn't have the go to special effects that, you know, okay, let's. You know, let's let's go extreme here. Um, Batman versus Superman. I, I thought that had a lot of potential. Um, I, oh yes, I, I liked the start of it. I thought they could have done more with some of the tension in there. But then the end, you know, it's like watching my kids play on the PS4. <laughs> <laughs> it's more more yeah. than combat on the big screen. You know, it's just a it's a computer game, and yeah, it destroys it. Uh, you know the end of the end of Wonder Woman was similar. You know, um, you know, tremendous work in all the lead up. You know, some great characterization, some really good plot points. But hey, we've got to have a boss battle. You know, what is it without a boss battle? Everything must have a boss battles are what sell movie tickets. Apparently, this is one that will shock you, readers. Who's my favorite writer? Would you uh. guess who my favorite writer of all time is? Because it's not a science fiction writer. You, know, you, you asked, you asked who my favorite science fiction writers were in the podcast. But are they, are they uh, dead or alive? They're alive. They're, okay. Uh, it's John. I'm go- it's John Green. Really? Really? I haven't read any of his books just because uh, I've only seen the movies. I've seen The Fault in Our Stars. I saw, and then what's the second one that they did? Um, oh, Paper Towns, I think was one. Yeah, paper. Yeah, Paper Towns. It's, it, paper Towns, the one where he, the, the girl, like lives across the street. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I didn't care for. I didn't care for that movie. Well, it, it's it, it's interesting. He's he's my favorite writer because he can get bums on a seat and sell books without leaning on the spectacular. You know, there's no zombies. There's no aliens. There's no death rays. It's just about the quality of the story. And, and I respect that. I really appreciate that. I would love to sit with him and dissect some of his books because I am sure I can see, as one writer to another, I'm sure I can see points at which he made critical changes. Paper Towns, I think, was two stories mashed together. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's an entirely different first act to the second act. Um, in Fault Now Stars, beautifully constructed, but right towards the end, I'm absolutely sure he changed the ending at least twice that I can. Detect. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but you know, just his uh, writing ability, uh, I I think is a, is brilliant. So when I when I write science fiction, I try not to use the science fiction as a crutch or as a prop or you know as a way of. Um, leaning on this, you know, having the story overly supported by it and just remind myself that, you know, John Green can pull all this off without any whiz bang, uh, you know, super fast spaceships. Yeah, that is true. It's interesting, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it really is. Once you think about it, now I'm starting to think about some of my favorite movies and how it would match up to your CGI versus story. (laughs) <laughs> like I haven't seen the third one yet, but I really enjoyed the remake of the Planet of the Apes. Oh, yeah, the the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remakes are always tricky because there's, you know, the inevitable comparison with the first version. You know, the the the, ch- the challenge is they they can almost push themselves too much to try to do something different. I'm I'm nervous about Blade Runner coming out for that reason. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, you know, there, there was the remake of um, what was the the Mars story, Philip K. Dick with uh, the the guy on Mars, um, Total Recall. They did the re- reboot of. Oh, really? Um, and and the reboot was quite good, but they they almost felt compelled to make it so different it could stand alone. Uh, and there was a couple of points where they just took it a bit too far, but some brilliant. Um, 
you know, uh, visual representations. And o- overall, I think they did a really good job. But yeah, remakes are always tricky. Yeah, yeah, they really are. 